I want you to grab your Bibles, open with me to the book of Acts. We're, I, I, I hesitate to use the expression, still in the book of Acts. It's, it's, we're actually making more progress than, than other men that I've known who've gone through this book. We're in chapter 16 now. And today we're going to be looking at discovering the will of God. And as we look at this, I, I, I know that even just in the last couple of days, I, I find out that people ask you questions and they don't really, you don't really know how to answer because what's in the question isn't really what they're trying to say. I mean, have you ever had that? Is there anything more frustrating than trying to figure out what someone else is thinking? You get these messages, they're supposed to be obvious, they're supposed to be clear, but they're anything but. Uh, kind of like this morning, uh, is that the shirt you're going to wear this morning? You know, uh, I wasn't sure exactly what she was trying to say, but uh, then I had to explain that this was the only orange shirt I had, and I didn't, didn't want to wear a red shirt, that would, that would get me lynched. Um, have you ever had somebody come in, and I don't mean yesterday, because yesterday would have been too obvious, but have you ever had somebody come in and just say, are you watching that ball game? You know, like maybe you've been dozing off or something. Or, or how about the, the call you get that says, are you doing anything next Saturday? And you, you're almost afraid to say no because you don't know what they want you to do. You, you, you just want them to, to, to just come right out. And sometimes you just want to say, just tell me what you want me to do. You know, you want me to change the shirt? You want me to change the program? You, what do you want me to do? And I think for a lot of people, trying to find the will of God is like that. They, they, they make it complicated because of the way they're, 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 they look at God's messaging around them, and they're saying, well, what, what, what are you trying to say to me? On the one hand, we want to know whether we're in the will of God, but then we're kind of hoping that the will of God doesn't change our plans too much. We're kind of hoping that the will of God hasn't going to infringe on what we had already planned to do, and that, and that we have forgotten that part of the model prayer. You remember the model prayer? That part that says, Thy kingdom come... Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray that. But the question is, do we want that? And do we mean that when we pray? Uh, I was surprised, and when I started making preparation for this, I was surprised to discover that the expression, the will of God, uh, really is, as an expression, only appears in the New Testament. But as you read through the Old Testament, you can't help but find God directing His people. You can't help but find God showing His will to Israel and others along the way. Uh, the book of Proverbs, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. If in all your ways you acknowledge Him... He says He will direct your paths. And that's, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, if you happen to have gotten a bulletin, Henry Blackaby wrote Experiencing God years and years ago. He coined the expression, he coined the phrase that we should find out where God is at work and join Him. You have probably have heard that, probably have used it. But he also had seven principles. Now, I'm not going to put them on the board. I've got them on the bulletin because that was too much to put on the board. And I'm going to go through them rather quickly. But principles, the seven principles that Henry Blackaby put forth is that, first of all, what we've already sang about, God is always at work around you. He's, he, he's working even when we don't feel it. He's working even when we are not aware of it. He's always at work around you. God pursues, secondly, a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. He wants to be a part of your life. Thirdly, God invites you to become involved with Him in His work. Fourthly, and we'll come back to this in the message, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, and in our Sunday school lesson this morning, that was very clear, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. Fifthly, God's invitation for you to work with Him always will lead you to a crisis of belief that requires not only faith, but action. I discovered a long time ago, and you may want to jot this down somewhere, God can't direct a parked car. A lot of times we just find a place and we get a good parking place and we wait. And we're looking for God to, to direct us, but He doesn't direct parked cars. You've got to be out there moving. You have to walk in the light that you have so that He can give you more light, so that He can sh show you which way to go. 
Sixthly, he said, you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what He is doing. And then finally, you come to know God by experience as you obey Him. And then He accomplishes His work through you. It's not us working for Him and trying to do our best for Jesus. It's finding where He is, joining Him, and then through His Spirit, He works through us. In Acts chapter 16, I hope you're already there in your Bibles, we find Paul seeking God's will and direction, and ultimately he will find it in this passage. If you're here this morning and you're looking for God's will for your life, I want to share with you some more this morning some simple principles that I think will help. We're going to start with finding God's direction. That's going to be Acts 16, 6 through 10. And you have your Bibles. Let me just read this for you, and you read along with me. It says, beginning at verse 6, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Mysia, then they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Passing Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Would you pray with me again? Lord, this morning, many of us are finding ourselves against the curb, trying to figure out where we need to go next, and maybe afraid to take that first step out. And so, Father, I just pray that as you lead us this morning through your word, that you'll lead us also into your will. And may we find our place where you are already at work. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. First thing in these principles that I want you to know about God's will is the first thing is that God's will is perfect. God's will is perfect. Uh, there's a couple of passages... Paul speaks of one in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, we've looked at this passage before. We've kind of unpacked this passage before. And what he's saying is that, you know, most of the time of Israel, they would give, offer burnt sacrifices. He says, no, we want you to be a living sacrifice. Die to self. I made the, kind, the statement when I shared this before with you that the problem with the living sacrifice is that a lot of times it tries to crawl off the altar. You want to be sure that you stay where God can work with you. Make yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is not, by the way, exceptional as a Christian. It's your reasonable service. This is what God expects of all of His children that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to Him. He says in verse 2, And don't be conformed to this world. We won't unpack all of that. We've done this before already. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't act like the world being something you're not. But be transformed because that's what Jesus in you is all about. It's not about information. It's not about education. It's about transformation. And He does so by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable. And here's our phrase. Perfect will of God. Do you know why the will of God is perfect? Because God is perfect. And somehow we, we tend to think that because we are seeking the will of God that uh, we're afraid that God will lead us into something that we just don't want to do. Something that we don't think we can do. We tend to fear the will of God for our lives when we forget just how much God not only knows us but loves us based on what He knows about us. You see, His perspective of us and our lives is so much greater than our own. He knows us better than we know ourselves. That's what Psalm 139 is all about. We tend to look at the immediate situation, that which is directly in front of us. God sees the whole picture. He sees it all. And by the way, He has been at work from eternity past to eternity future. And there is no end to his work. The prophet Isaiah talks about this perspective that God has. He says in Isaiah 55, 8, 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. You, you don't have the same desires I have. 
We need to find out what His thoughts are. We need to find out what His ways are. For verse 9 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. Why? Because my perspective is so much higher. He sees what's going on in your life. He not only knows what's best for you, He knows what you can and should be going through next. His knowledge is of us is thorough. He's the creator, not the spectator. He doesn't just watch us. He didn't just make us, wind us up, and turn us loose. He doesn't just watch us and then try to decide, well, I wonder what next step they should be. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 16.9, he orders our steps. A man's heart may plan his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We may think we know better how to plan our life. We may think we know better how to live our lives. But we forget who made us. We forget why he made us. Going back to Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 29, Isaiah made this observation. He used the illustration of a potter. And he says, you know, those of you who, who think that, that you know better what's for your life and you want to go this direction when God wants you to go, he says, verse 16, surely you've turned things around. Shall the potter, God, be esteemed as the clay? In other words, should he just be thought of like, like the part of the process? Shall the thing made say of him who made it, he didn't make me. Now, you've heard me talk about this before, and I'm not going to make a big, big deal about it this morning, but for those of you who have heard it said that we just came here by happen chance, that we are the products of chance and evolution, and that there was no design, no divine designer, that there was no creator, the whole purpose of that type of teaching and understanding and theory, and I, I, I emphasize that it's a theory, is to take away the position that God is our creator. He made us, and whereas you may look to science to tell you the who, what, when, where, and how, you can't find out from science the why. You get the why from God. And God made us for a purpose. And he knows that purpose. He's the potter. We are the clay. He goes on to say in that same verse, Shall the thing formed say of him who formed it? Well, he may have made me, but he doesn't know me. He has no understanding. He didn't know what he was doing. He doesn't know what he's doing now. Do you honestly believe that about God? That he has no understanding? He is the potter. He is the creator. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And that's why His will for our life is perfect. Second thing I'd like you to know about God's will is that God's will is knowable. You say, well, I, maybe His will is perfect, but I, I'm never going to figure out what it is. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe you're trying to figure out what it is. We'll see that in just a moment. You see, God's not trying to play hide and seek with us. He wants us to know His will for our lives. When Moses was writing the law in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, he made this statement, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him. And notice this big if. If you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. The same conditions that he said about how we should love Him. We should love Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. If you're seeking God with all your heart and with all your soul, His word says, You'll find me. The problem is that we can't seem to find the will of God because we're seeking God like a thief seeks a policeman. No hurry to find one. Not looking very hard. You know, later on in their history, Jeremiah wrote to Israel. And he took the same principle that was found in the law in Deuteronomy. And in Jeremiah 29, 13, he says, And if you will seek me and find me, or excuse me, and you will seek me and find me, when? It went from if to when. And now it's when you search for me with all your heart. Have you done that yet? 
Have you turned your heart to Jesus? Have you turned your heart to seek God? Sometimes we seek Him in the wrong places. It just seems maybe our, our thinking and our plans are just, you know, it's more convenient for us to look for Him where we want to be. I remember a, a story I heard a long time ago one evening. A boy was under a street light. The, the, the sun had gone down. He was under a street light, and the light was shining over a certain area. And he was under the street light, and he was diligently on his hands and knees looking for something he had lost. An older gentleman came along, and he says, Son, what are you doing? He says, Well, I, I dropped my ring, and I'm looking for my ring. And he says, Oh, well, maybe I can help you. Did you drop it here near the light, light post? He says, No. It came off over in the field where we were playing over across the street. He said, well, why are you looking over here? He says, well, the light's better over here. Sometimes we aren't looking where God is because we want it to be more convenient for us. Sometimes we run ahead of Him. We get ahead of God and then we just ask Him to bless our efforts instead of looking for where He is already at work. Go back to your Bible, back to Acts 16. Let's look at verse 6. I want, I want to go through these verses with you again and show you the process. I read it rather quickly on purpose because they just sound like words and places. But I want, to, I want to walk you through them a little bit more now. Verse 6 says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia. Now I just want to remind you that Galatia was where he was on the first missionary journey, which was about two, two years earlier than this. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Going on into verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go down to Bithynia. The Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Now that probably still doesn't make any more sense to you than the first time I read it. So allow me to show you with a map. It will be a little easier to see. We start with a map, and this is of Paul's entire second missionary journey. Now, they had been in Galatia in that area, and there you can see where they had been through Lystra and Derbe and Iconium. They came to Antioch, which was one of the first places they came to. And from there, Paul tried to go west. And when he tried to go west, he was trying to go to Asia Minor. Holy Spirit forbid him. So, they went north to Mysia. That's about where Mysia is. And there were no open doors for there either. So they tried to go northeast to Bithynia. And when they did, the Holy Spirit turned them around again. And they finally ended up going southwest and found themselves on the shore of Troas, next to the Aegean Sea, with nowhere else to go on that landmass. When you see the map and the wandering, it makes a little bit more sense. You see, Paul had tried to find God's will by traveling in three different directions only to find himself unable, and get this, to determine for himself God's will. Here's the problem that you and I fall into many times. We try to figure out God's will. We try to determine for ourselves God's will. And that brings us to the third principle that I want you to see this morning, and that is that God's will is discovered, not determined. Not determined by us. It's determined by Him, but it's not determined by us. This is exactly why Jesus taught us to pray when He was teaching the disciples there in Matthew 6, uh, or Matthew 7, Seek and you will find. Now, there are three different words. He says, uh, ask, seek, and knock. But this one in the middle, seek, talks of a process. And we talked about this on Wednesday nights. When we talked about prayer, we talked about this extensively, that seeking prayers are, are those prayers we pray to discover God's will through a process. And that's exactly what Paul had just gone through. He'd just gone through a process of seeking God's will and seeking God's direction. Seeking prayers also always relate to the kingdom and its growth. We, don't, we ask for things we need. We seek God's kingdom. You say, how do you know that? Well, because Jesus said, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All the things like the food and the drink, and all those things He says that the Gentiles need. But you seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things can be added to you. Somebody once said, if we don't seek the, first the kingdom of God, we won't seek it at all, and I about, about believe him. 
Paul will say, well, what does it make to mean to seek the kingdom of God? Well, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says this, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. You see, when we seek the kingdom of God, we're seeking the king. And when we seek the king, we find what he's doing in the kingdom. And then we are able to join him where he is at work. We discover God's will as we find ourselves seeking those things that God is already involved in. Now, when I read to you Henry Blackaby's seven principles, uh, we discover God's will. You'll notice back on the list there that it says, he said, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through, and he mentioned four things. First one was the Bible. His most reliable method of revealing His will is through His Word. And we need to, as our, you may have had in your Sunday school class this morning, I know we did, been reminded to read our Bibles daily, to have access to those kinds of directions. I once made the comment that the, the Bible is like, a, is like a road map to life. The Holy Spirit's a GPS that tells you when to redirect recalculate. He says God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, His most reliable method, and also through prayer. As you interact with Him, and again, you should be doing this on a daily basis, that as you pray, you talk to Him, and then I, I have to say, I, I don't know that I have ever heard an audible voice, but I have, I have sensed it direction and oddly enough it usually comes in the mornings when I'm first waking up I've sensed direction that was unmistake unmistakably from God and so prayer is his way of communicating with us as well uh, we'll see this in just a moment with Paul and this this move to Macedonia circumstances Paul went in one direction the door was closed he went in another direction the door was closed he went in another direction the door was closed he finally came through circumstances was using God was using to confirm his direction through opened and closed doors and then finally the church uh, I think it should be reminded to us back in chapter 13 it was the church that sent Paul and Barnabas out in the begin with it was the church that saw God's will for their life it was one part of the body of Christ helping another part of the body of Christ discover direction. And that's why I think it's important sometimes when people at church see things in you that you may not have seen right away. That you maybe didn't catch that God may be trying to work with you and deal with you in. Sometimes those suggestions come. For Paul... God used the church to confirm the initial calling to the missionary work. In Acts 16, God uses a vision as part of Paul's prayer in seeking direction. Look at verse 9 again. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. This leads me to our fourth principle about discovering God's will for our life. And that is that God's will many times involves others. You look in a little further and you'll see something interesting in verse 10. I don't know if you caught this or not when we read it through, but let me just point it out to you, and you can see it on the screen as well. Uh, Acts 16.10, Now after he had seen the vision, immediately, and look what, look what, and I have it bold on the screen, we, we sought to go to Macedonia. Who's we? Well, who's writing the book? Luke. And we know that Luke became a traveling companion and a fellow missionary with Paul. This is where he joined him. You see, up to this time, Luke only mentioned what God was doing through them. And by them, he meant Paul and Silas, and, and by this time, Timothy, who he had picked up in Lystra that we saw last week. But something changed when Paul and the team... We're getting ready to cross the Aegean Sea. Luke joined them. Some have made the suggestion that perhaps Luke was the man from Macedonia. Uh, the only thing I have to say about that is that Luke is still on this side 
over in Troas because it says that we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Notice his inclusion in the calling. The Lord has called us to preach the gospel to them. The will of God for Paul had become the same will of God for Luke. And he got involved in this missionary enterprise. Sometimes God's will for your life is to join up with somebody who's already following God's will for their life. And you become part of the ensemble. Because God doesn't usually work with just lone rangers. God usually is putting teams together. And as He's putting teams together, people discover what's God's will for their life as it is going. The will of God will always engage us in God's purposes for God's glory and God's kingdom. Remember the prayer, Thy kingdom come. That's what it's about. It's about the kingdom of God. It's not just about the local church. We, we, we rejoice to see God bringing people to church. But God is more interested in the kingdom as a whole than He is just simply the gathering at this place. Now, I don't say that to, to diminish the importance of you being here because this makes you part of the kingdom effort. And in a couple of weeks, when, when those of you who have, have felt God's tug to be a part of what we, God is doing through this church out at the party at the park, you will be engaging in a concerted effort of the church. But it will be for the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, let me, uh, let me move to the next part. There's a, there's a second part to this passage. It's Acts 16, 11 through 15. And it's discovering or finding God's purpose. We discover God's will through those things that we've just looked at. But now we want to make sure we're, we're clear on God's purpose because God's purpose is always connected to God's will. Reading the passage with you in your Bible, therefore sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia. It, notice it says a colony in your Bible. That means it's a Roman colony, and that will become significant and important next week. We'll, we'll, be, we'll still be in Philippi next week. We were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, I want you to catch this in verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went out to the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. We sat down, we spoke to the women who met there. It's been noted that there was no synagogue in Philippi. Paul and his team don't go to the synagogue as they have in other places. This is a Roman colony, but it doesn't have a Jewish settlement. It doesn't have enough Jewish men and families to constitute a synagogue. It takes about 10 uh, Jewish family members, uh, Jewish men and their families to constitute a synagogue. Mostly, there was just women who were seeking God and worshiping Him. And the city was mostly pagan, as we'll see next week. One of the God worshipers was named Lydia. She worshiped God. But she needed Jesus. Hear me again. She worshiped God, but she needed Jesus. It wasn't enough just to be a God worshiper. The Ethiopian eunuch was a worshiper of God. Cornelius was a worshiper of God. These men worshiped God. They wanted to know God, but they needed to come through God's Son, Jesus Christ. And so do you. Just wanting to worship God is not enough. She worshiped God, but she needed Jesus. Cindy and I were in Pigeon Forge this past week. We, we splurged. We went to a golden corral. Oh, my goodness. Do you know how hard it is to stay on a diet at Golden Corral? Well, I'm glad you do. I tell you, it's, uh, but it's not impossible. But we had a server, 
and I can't remember his name. I know it started with a B. Banat. He was from Jerusalem, but he wasn't Jewish. He said, I'm Catholic, I'm Christian. And then the more we began to talk, the more he talked about how he hoped to go to heaven someday, that God would see his good works, that they would be greater than his bad works. And he's not alone. A lot of people want to go to heaven, want to know God, want to find that balance between their good works and their bad works. And I'm just taking just a few moments, because he's working, we can't, we can't do this for long, but taking just a few moments, we explained that even one sin was enough to keep him from heaven. But that Jesus came to deal with the sin issue, and that's what makes... And he was looking forward to going back to Jerusalem. I said, that's what makes there at Jerusalem, Calvary is so important. We got to share with him. We hope it took. Lydia was a woman who worshipped God, but she needed Jesus. And the certain woman named Lydia heard us, verse 14. Look, look at what it says. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. But the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized... She begged us, saying, if you, have, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. The final section of this part of the passage introduces us to Paul in Philippi, which, and we'll, we'll see more in detail next week. But for now, let us discover that finding God's will and direction for our lives will always lead us to fulfilling God's purpose. And what is God's purpose for our life? God's purpose for our life will always lead us to ways to glorify God. It leads us through Jesus Christ. May I remind you this morning, we exist for Him. He doesn't exist for us. He's the potter, we're the clay. He's the creator, we're the creation. We were made in His image. He is not made in our image. He's not a God after our own making. Bottom line, folks, He doesn't answer to us. We ultimately answer to Him. And we derive our purpose from Him. And discovering His will will bring us closer to discovering our purpose in life. Maybe you're struggling in life right now because you just don't seem to have a purpose of what you're going to be doing next. For Paul, it was a discovery of where to go next. He wanted to share the life-changing news of Jesus Christ with those who would hear and receive. He traveled through sm that small island of Samothrace, and then coming ashore at Neapolis and finally coming to the city of Philippi. He was following God's will. Why? Because he was following God's purpose. And it was there he found an open heart to the gospel. Look at that verse with me again. Verse 14. A certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God and the Lord opened her heart. That's why Paul was there. That was his purpose in being there. To heed the things spoken by Paul. God had prepared a woman who was a God worshiper. Notice how Luke describes her conversion. He, he says the Lord just opened her heart. We've looked at this before about how there are different grounds in which the seed of God falls. What kind of ground is yours this morning? Is it fertile ground? Are you has just been waiting for God to, to open himself up to you and then to open your heart to him? <coughs> Last thing I want you to see about this is that Lydia became a person of peace. We talked about this on Wednesday nights. We described this not too many weeks ago. Look at verse 15. When she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. And Lydia became a person of peace who helped Paul and those who were with him get to know more Philippians. So that later on, there will be a church in Philippi. There may not be a synagogue, but there will be a church. And God used this, this God worshiper named Lydia, opened her heart, and then she opened her home. And she became one completely involved in the growing church. She was the first fruits, you might say, of Philippi. Next week, we'll see a more 
dramatic story, a jailer, an earthquake. But for now, let us always be looking for the fruit. The fruit that comes when we seek first the kingdom of God and His will for our lives. Would you pray with me?